Wow, that's the fastest I've ever seen people take their seats. That's great. Good afternoon. I'm Jim O'Connor, standing in for Chris Valenti, the chair of the Forums Committee of the Economic Club of Chicago. On behalf of the committee, I welcome you to the club's third forum of the 2011-2012 program year. Please enjoy your lunch. We will start our program promptly at 1230 with a great cast of speakers on an incredibly topical issue for Chicago. So please enjoy your lunch, and I'll come back in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. We are delighted to have such distinguished speakers today join us on a very important topic in Chicago titled The Future of Urban Education. Before we begin our program, I have a few club announcements to make. Our 84th annual dinner meeting will take place on Thursday, April 12th, here at the Hyatt Regency Chicago. We're very pleased to welcome the brilliant inventor and entrepreneur, Elon Musk, as our speaker for this dinner. Many of you have heard of Mr. Musk, but if you haven't, he is currently the CEO and CTO of SpaceX, a private space rocket company that's aiming to send the first privately funded space flight uh, within the next three years. But prior to that, Elon had a significant uh, experience with serving as a CEO of Tesla Motors, where he was responsible for product development and bringing to market some incredible new electric cars. And even prior to that, he hails from PayPal, which, as you all know, is the premier internet payment system. I'd also like to announce that this year's fifth night celebration will take place on May 10th at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater in celebration of their 25th anniversary and will include fellow member Barbara Gaines, who's an exceptional uh, leader in the Shakespeare field. On May 18th, we are honored to host the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, for a special luncheon meeting at the Hilton Chicago Hotel. Today's meeting will begin with a panel discussion, followed by questions from the floor. As is tradition with all forums, we will suspend with lengthy introductions due to time constraints. However, full bios are available at your tables, and hopefully you've had a chance to see them if you don't already know the participants today. So it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Dr. Timothy Knowles serves as the John Dewey Director of the University of Chicago Urban Education Initiative, as well as clinical professor on the Committee on Education. This organization is dedicated to creating knowledge to produce reliably excellent schooling for children growing up in urban America. Prior to coming to Chicago, Timothy served as Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning at the Boston Public Schools. And while in Boston, he also created two organizations devoted to building the pipeline of high quality teachers and school leaders for Boston Public Schools and served as co-chair of the Boston Annenberg Challenge, a nationally recognized effort to improve literacy instruction. Tim has his BA in Anthropology and African History from Oberlin College and an MA and doctorate from that little school in Boston, Harvard Graduate School of Education. So this topic today that I'll hand over to Tim is on the top of mind of most Chicagoans. We talked earlier in the preface meeting about the issue, and I think we all concluded that there's no topic that is as issue-oriented for today's Chicago uh, businessman and woman than education. In fact, with one of the participants, Josh and I were talking earlier, that this issue is roughly 30 years old, the issue of Chicago school reform. And Sally Blanton and I talked about why it's so important from a global perspective to think about this issue. And we're very fortunate uh, through the work of the Forums Committee to have assembled uh, several key players in the issue of Chicago educational reform across a wide spectrum of uh, diversity and issues related to what we can do in Chicago to make a real difference by breaking some of the molds and thinking about things collectively as a community. So with that, I will hand it over to Timothy, who will take it from there. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to stand just for a minute because uh, it's uh, an incredible um, showing that the Economics Club of Chicago has um, drawn to this most critical issue. Thank you for joining us um, for lunch. Uh, this is a wonderful and rare opportunity to discuss the future of Chicago schooling. And it's a formidable panel. John Claude Brizard the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. To his left, Mike Milkey, the superintendent of the Noble Street Network, 
uh, of charter schools, one of the highest performing charter networks in the city. And to Mike's left, Sister Mary Pohl, the superintendent of the Catholic schools. What is so unusual is that this panel represents the full portfolio of public, parochial, and charter options in Chicago. These three people are responsible for the education of the vast majority of the children in our city. Indeed, the only group that I think is missing from, from this panel are the homeschoolers that I elected not to, to invite because they should be home, right? School. <laughs> So before we plunge in, a bit of context. We know that the quality of, of, of schooling is instrumental to Chicago's economy. We also know it's vital to our democracy and to our social fabric. We also know that we face huge challenges. The Consortium on Chicago School Research, the Applied Research Group of the Urban Education Institute, has shed light on precisely how far we have to go. A few years ago, as many of you may know, we tracked every single ninth grade student in Chicago public schools through a four-year college degree. And we found that 6.5% of ninth graders have a four-year college degree by the time they're 25. If you're an African-American boy, the number was 2.5%. Those numbers exclude students with disabilities, so one in 50 African-American boys in ninth grade were then, at that time, finishing college by the time they were 25. I think we can all agree that that's beyond broken. This fall, we released a, a report that we called the Three Eras Report that looked at 20 years of school reform in Chicago. While we did see significant improvement in terms of high school graduation rates and incremental improvement in terms of high school test score results on the ACT, we, have found, we found that the achievement gap between African American and Latino students and their white and Asian peers had widened and that elementary school reading scores haven't moved in 20 years. We have many miles to go before we sleep. So, to my panel, and now I'll join you. Um, if, uh, first a question for, for each of you, the same question for each of you. In light of that challenge and the reality that our children in Chicago face, t give us two or three, maybe four minutes for you, John Claude, <laughs> on what your priorities are such that the next 20 years can be years that Chicago uh, are proud of. So I guess I, I get to start. Um, so thank you, Tim. Yep. I think one of our um, difficulties often is that we don't stick to a reform agenda. We have a, a joke in education that if you pick one philosophy, every 20 years it's current. Uh, we tend to sort of cycle the same things over and over again, uh, but we don't stick to what we know actually works when it comes to, to education um, reform. So. In, in, in our case, uh, we didn't want to have a thousand different initiatives, so we're focusing on three fundamental levers that we know will get us where we need to get to. Um, there's some who may believe that the full school day is, is a strategy, it's actually a tactic, um, it, 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 is a, it is an initiative, a tool we want to give to principals and teachers. So the first lever we, um, goes back to our school-based leaders. Um, the principal is key. So many of us across this country focus on teacher effectiveness. While that's critical, um, the, the, the effectiveness of the school-based leader is fundamental for success. And there are not many exemplars in terms of principal preparation programs or system-wide development for principals across the country. So it is one we intend to build and have been building since going back to last July. So that's one major lever. And of course, the principal with a constellation of great teachers will create wonderful things for kids. The second one goes back to portfolio. That includes parochial charters, um, et cetera. So what do we have in terms of quality schools and programs across the city? Um, are we responding for the, for the right school for every child concept across the city? So the portfolio, the collection of schools across the city is a second major lever that we're looking at in terms of making sure that works for, for children. The, the last one goes back to families and probably the hardest thing that we have to do as a school district. How do we find ways to empower families 
to become what so many of us call demand parents across the city. I would guess all of you here are demand parents. Um, and I tell my principals, a parent in your office yelling at you is, a, is an engaged parent, um, one that is a demanding parent. So how do you do that for, for so many people who have been disenfranchised from the system, who had terrible experiences when they were students themselves at schools who may not have a college education or a high school education, I think is, is the third really most difficult thing that we have to do. That layer of accountability, that pressure point on schools will always keep the system on. So those three, of course, there's much more in terms of nuances around that. Um, but those three, I think, will, will actually get us where we're going to get to, but we have to stick to this reform agenda over the long haul. Thanks, Michael. Mike? <coughs> so Noble um, has to keep our eye on the ball of making sure we do well with our uh, existing students and the ones that we continue to serve. So we have 6,500 right now. If I'm doing my job well, we'll serve them uh, as well as possible before anything else. And I think that any success that we've had has been because of our focus on our product in this case, providing students with a really great education. And then um, secondly, we want to be part of Jean-Claude's and CPS's portfolio um, uh, components so that we are part of it. Um, and, and again, with appropriate schools, um, we think that th the more good schools and the more competition that's out there, the stronger we all become. And I think, uh, you know, my hat's off to CPS for saying, how can we provide as many options to parents as possible? We'd like to continue. So right now we have a plan to grow to double our size, to serve up to 15,000 students. Again, serve them well, but also be part of the change that the district uh, is proposing, uh, where it's not so much a school system, but a system of schools that answers to parents really well. Mr. Mayor Cole. Well, I, I get to cheat a little bit, uh, and the reason I get I get to cheat is that uh, Catholic schools really are schools of choice. So when we take a look at Catholic school systems, we really know that um, we've got parents who are making that choice for their education. So that's why we can have 99% of our kids graduate from high school. It's why we can track that even the 1% that, let, that left us pretty much have a good option. Uh, the other situation, I don't know if this is working real well, um, the other situation that we have, obviously, is because we have that kind of support. We can go ahead and say, in our elementary schools, we wind up with uh, those, our kids who graduate from Catholic elementaries, 95% of them graduate from high school, whether they go to a public school, private school, or charter. Now, there's, there are reasons for that, and, and my three things would be, other than more kids in great Catholic schools, is time, is give the kids the time. 20% uh, more teaching time really does make a difference. Uh, give them testing that absolutely does track what's fair and what's real in terms of assessment, not as a, not as a mean lover, but really as something that tests that performance. And finally then, to your point, Jean-Claude, to go ahead and to provide those kind of teaching and resources that we need that gets them up to date with the Common Core standards with what's gonna make them successful uh, through college and beyond. Thank you, I, I wanna turn first to you and say, can you hear me? <laughs> um, okay, uh, is that a yes? Um, so Jean-Claude talked about one of the levers being the portfolio, um, this idea of a portfolio, and on the stage is a whole portfolio. Um, the portfolio includes doing some very hard things, creating a portfolio of options, uh, includes making hard decisions. In Chicago alone, there's at least 150 chronically underperforming schools. There's at least 100 schools that are 50% enrolled or less. Um, some of those two groups overlap. Mm -hmm. This raises important educational and moral questions about what are we doing with schools that are chronically failing. The mayor and John Claude recently, as I'm sure the great majority of you know, um, made a hard call and that was to close or turn around 17 schools um, at the school board meeting two weeks ago. So my question for you, Jean-Claude, you, you may be propelled by the right moral and educational um, reasons, but the reality is there's enormous resistance to this kind of reform, not just here in Chicago, but nationally. 
how are you going to create the civic will in this city that makes that the norm um, and doesn't slow you down from, from doing, uh, making the hard decisions you need to make? It's a small question. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a great question. In fact, on Friday, I was uh, talking to uh, Dennis Walcott, who's the uh, Chancellor of Schools in New York City, about their turnaround and closure process in New York City, and we're talking about ways of trying to make that a little bit uh, sort of calmer and, and, and more acceptable. And I'm sure if you watch the news, New York is no, no calmer um, than, than it was here. In fact, I would argue I, I should be calmer in Chicago than it was in New York um, during this kind of work. Um, it, it's a big issue, and in fact, if I may just quickly paint a picture, uh, we have parts of our city that have said to me, we don't want any noble street in our community. Meanwhile, you've got some of the highest performing um, schools within that particular network. And why would anyone say, I don't want this in my community is a question that we often struggle um, um, trying to answer. When you look at the, the gap that we have to close, it, it, it is huge. Um, we're talking earlier to, um, this afternoon about the gap between um, high SES or affluent schools in America and affluent schools, say, in Finland or Singapore. Um, and as a country, even our highest uh, social economic status, 15 year olds are ranking 26, 27 out of 30 uh, when compared to other uh, sort of uh, industrialized nations around the, around the world. And when you look at in, in schools in poor parts of our city and you compare that to a Walter Payton, then compare that to say a school in Singapore, you begin to really understand the, the large gap that we have, we have to close. It's, it's monumental. So the, the solution um, uh, for us very simply, one is to be bold and not to always sort of cave in to, um, to political or, or, or pressures. At the same time too, we do know that there is a big word public in our school system um, that we have to respond to. We've got to keep engaging community. Part of our difficulty um, is, is, is such that the, the, the vocal minority often are the ones you hear in the press. They're the ones protesting and, and, and screaming. Um, and you, you sit back and wonder why anyone would try to protect um, say a diet or crane with a 60% dropout rate uh, for 10 years. Why anyone would try to protect that? Um, it, you, you sort of sit back and you try to absorb. Uh, but you do have people, we had one parent at the board meeting who came in and said to us, I don't care if you turn it around, flip it inside out, uh, rip it apart, do what you've got to do to fix it. My daughter goes to that school, I don't want her not to graduate high school, do what you've got to do. So it takes a lot of courage for, for, this, for, this, for this individual, for this gentleman to come in in the midst of all this noise at the board meeting to push against the masses, at least the appearance of masses pushing back on the system. So I think part of the solution, I think, I will say perhaps two things. Um, one is to make sure that we find a way to get the voices of the majority to be heard as well. There are many, many parents uh, and many children and folks in the schools who are looking for a change, yet are not the ones who come to the board meeting to, to, to yell. Somehow we've got to get that, 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 that voice to be heard. Um, and we don't do a good job um, at that, not just in Chicago, I think across the country. Uh, the second, I think, is better informing community about where the schools really are. So I'll give you a quick data point. Uh, about six weeks ago, um, with a group called Stand for Children, we called 47,000 people on the west and south of the city. It was a telephone town hall. At any given time, for the two hours, we had 9,000 people on the phone engaging us in conversation about schools. And we asked a question. How many of you know the quality rating of your school? We ranked them one, two, and three. 79% had no idea. Um, and despite a, a massive public campaign uh, in the fall, backpack school report card that Noemi actually had designed with a team um, that went home via backpack to, to parents. Uh, Mary and I did these round tables with parents or televised. Despite a massive campaign, nearly 80% of the folks listening to us had no idea. So somehow we got to do a better job of either getting people angry about the situation in their schools um, and help them see um, what, what they can actually have in, in exchange to that. I think if we do a better job of engaging people, um, it perhaps on the front end, uh, getting them to go visit uh, uh, great schools across the city, because we have some of the best schools in the country right here in Chicago, getting those folks out to see, uh, we can begin to push the ground, grassroots efforts um, in, in getting the silent minority to be much more vocal uh, about the, what, what they have, what they're experiencing. So think about it, if all you see is that, if that's where you went to school, 
um, and the children go to the exact same school, it has been underperforming for 20 years. If you've never seen something better, there's no context. We had one parent that went to visit um, National Teachers Academy, an NTA school, an AUSL school. Uh, this parent was a, was a parent at Price Elementary. She came back, she says, I'm sold, I saw it, my God, I'm gonna get that. Uh, and she became one of our biggest advocates. So we've got to do this at a much larger scale. That I think would be a much a bigger part of the solution. We're gonna start much earlier this year um, before we actually have to do this again next year. Thank you. Um, Sister Mary Cole, the Archdiocese schools are um, unusual, both in the national um, context, the Archdiocese schools, particularly in Chicago, in the sense that they are not struggling with growth. They are actually, they've held steady or, or grown um, over the last several years when many other uh, parochial school systems have struggled to, to hold on to um, kids. So two part question for you, how are you doing that? What, what makes the, the work in Chicago distinct, particularly in this economy? And related to it, how, how would you do it more? How, how, can, how can we expand the options for, for, for Chicago's children in, in parochial sc schools? That's a great question, Tim. I think that's a great question. question. <laughs> first, it starts with, I think first it starts very much with the quality of the product. So you have something to sell, you have something to market. That's important. The second piece actually belongs to ownership, so that's alumni, parents, teachers, that's alumni, parents, teachers, and especially in the city of Chicago, we have the shoulder fund. And big shoulder fund has really had its boots on the ground with regard to not only enrollment and marketing, not only support of the schools, but in its 25th year, it is doing what other dioceses are only just dreaming to do, to have a separate foundation that's truly um, focusing on the inner city schools. So it's a huge uh, concept for us. Oh, you're so nice. Um, so one of the other pieces then that we really have, uh, in addition to the, the product and the, the strong support of alumni, parents, uh, a, a community around these students, whether it's Big Shoulders or our alumni community, I could be really embarrassing and ask, how many, how many of you have gone to a Catholic school or sent your kid to one. And yes, hello. And, and we're gonna find, we're gonna find um, a lot of the community leaders because that's exactly what that is. It's, it's focused on that parental choice. So how can you help me expand this? The first is let the money follow the kid on federal programs. Both IDEA and title money, we have to do a battle every year to get that money. Every single superintendent, including John Paul today, says, I would love to have this follow the child. This would really help our kids in the poorest areas, the kids with our need, and it's their money. It's money generated by your tax money that we could prove we're using effectively. The second piece would be to support some kind of choice legislation. V, vouchers, that's a dirty word. Let's, call, let's really not call it vouchers or anything around vouchers, but let's talk about scholarships. Let's talk about what Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Arizona have done, which is to allow businesses and individuals to put money into a scholarship fund that would then allow parents making, any parent across the state, making under $50,000 to apply for a scholarship. Now these are modest, they're like $3,000, but I could really educate a grade schooler for about six, six two. That's pretty economical. You give me three, you know what? That makes a lot of these middle class families where we really are struggling to get those kids in the Collar County, Blue County workers, the opportunity to really make and have parental choice again, so. Thank you. Um, we're not gonna talk about vouchers unless you have questions about vouchers. No, it's vouchers. dirty words, we don't want <laughs> vouchers. Let's talk about other things. Scholarship, I, no, no, I was no also, I was also gonna ask, Claude questions about labor, but I decided I wouldn't because <laughs> John Claude is in the middle of labor negotiations and so can't talk about anything interesting. So I'm instead <laughs> I'm going to ask Mike about labor, which Thanks. will be interesting. I can almost guarantee you. Um, so Mike, um, the, the the your data speak for themselves. You're getting great results. Um, there are other charter management organizations in the city that are getting persuasive results and many nationwide that are as well. The, in parallel to that, as charter management organizations grow in Chicago and elsewhere, um, the, the, the threat to organized labor grows as well. 
in essence, you represent a threat to their membership. Um, and what we're seeing now increasingly in Chicago and increasingly across the country are, are charter school teachers being organized, being unionized. How, again, with a 20-year lens, how do we ensure that charter schools don't become a version of what we have today with incredibly thick uh, teacher contracts governing every move we make as a profession? Um, how, do we ensure, how do we ensure the charter schools maintain their auto autonomy um, and, and, and not become, become a version of that? Thanks. Jim, did we invite the press to this? <laughs> we did. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I will be, I They're see, all here, I see Ross all here. back there, Ross is here, <laughs> more, all right, so, um, so I do think, here, here's where legislation is important, um, the charter legislation passed in Illinois in 96 said that uh, charter teachers could form a union, but they could not be part of the local collective bargaining union, so as opposed to saying charter's good, union's bad, I would say that a monolithic union that represents tens of thousands of teachers, just like a monolithic district that is one bureaucracy without a lot of competition and choice, is not gonna serve students well. And so that, the beauty of that legislation was that charter school teachers could form unions, but they would be a different collective bargaining unit. And the, the charter schools in Chicago that have formed unions have much lighter contracts. Instead of tax code sized collective bargaining agreements, they are 40 or 50 pages. And I think that um, that alone, and to keep that uh, uh, kind of uh, charter legislation before us where the local can't, the, the one local can't organize teachers, I think is really power or important. Because where you, I think, run into trouble is when one union has so much political power, especially when you're talking about a public employees union, when they're so, so big, they have a disproportionate amount of influence in places like Springfield. If there are, smaller ones still representing teachers, then I think that that's gonna work much better for students and you're gonna have contracts that are much shorter, much more flexible. Um, for Noble, we like how it is right now and if 20 years from now there's not a union, we're still happy with that. Um, but we understand that that causes us to make sure we treat our teachers well and, and pay them in, as competitively as possible and reward them for, for performance. But if, um, uh, the, they decide to organize, that's still their right. Um, and we're okay in general, as I look across, not just speaking for Noble, but across education across the country, I think if there's competing unions who gotta make sure that they're performing the same way the competing schools gotta wake, make sure they're performing. So I think the laws have to say such that it becomes, it's not an easy thing to organize, because if that's the case, I do worry about 20 years from now. But I think that Illinois' law is good, and I think other states have similar laws, and I think that's a way that we keep, as long as there's not one huge district, one huge union, I think you're gonna get much better results for students when the competition of both unions um, and schools without unions are, are both, as, both out there as good choices for parents. So now I have a, a, a sort of strange set of questions for, for you before I open it up to the audience, so prepare your questions now. Um, if you haven't yet, and you'll see people with paddles, I think they're called, and microphones um, if you have a question in a minute. Um, the, this is sort of a dream scenario. You, you wake up in the morning and you're in each other's shoes. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> and, and I don't mean something magic, even though the dream scenario would suggest it. I mean, what would you actually do that day if you wake up at at each other's desk. Um, so I don't mean wave your wand and you suddenly have 672 exemplary principles in your schools that day. I mean, what lever would you really, would you press? Um, so starting with Sister Mary Paul, you, you, you wake up and you're CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, okay. it, it may be a um, nightmare scenario. Hey, I have my <laughs> own board. Hello, everyone, yeah. So there are a lot of demands out there. I, I, I think really it's a great question. It is about kids, and it is about a parent's responsibility to educate their children. So I think I would organize a citywide read program to early to babies. I'm talking sit the kid on your lap and read to them. Read, 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 read. Flood them with words. 
And then I would make sure that by third grade, every single kid could read. I told my, t my, my principals, don't be happy till your school's on the 90th percentile literacy for those kids at the end of the third grade. Because if you cannot learn to read, you cannot read to learn the rest of your life. The next lever that we know is the most success for college is to focus on math at those seventh graders. Focus on getting that algebraic, concrete thinking going. Um, it, it unites the system. It's kind of keep it simple, stupid. It's, it's supporting parents, flooding kids with words, getting them to read, teaching them numeracy, and then I think we can have our kids be successful in high school. They're, why are they frustrated in high school? They haven't had those expectations from the time they were babies, and we haven't found a way to support the gains that are proven in early childhood, and CPS has made those, but you cannot sustain that unless you have a, a very deliberate program moving through the schools. And schools get inherit everything, and CPS inherits even more than we do in terms of expectations. And people always say to me, you know, the schools have failed. And I say, well, if they did, no one else showed up for the test. And I really, I really mean that. We cannot continue to ask our schools to do it all. We have to begin to say, this is our, these are our children, this is our community, and here are some key levers that we're going to ask every single person to do. To your point of demanding parents, we have them. And that is the critical difference, a demanding parent and a demanding community that shares that same expectation. It goes to the culture of the city, not just the structure of what we're trying to do in education. Good luck, John Claude. <laughs> Wait, we're before, taking notes, I think, uh, too. <laughs> before, you, before you leave the office, I, I have a follow-up. Um, what, what about uh, one of the things that, that the archdiocese schools clearly have, as charter schools have, is this ability, parents make an affirmative choice. They make an affirmative choice to come and stay. And one of the things they encounter when they get there is an incredibly rich and um, disciplined life in terms of schooling. What about discipline? How would you approach that in John? Oh, Ford's that's view? a great question. You know, I've always thought you could have a, even, I have actually talked to a couple of superintendents in much smaller districts and said, who were really struggling, I said, why not a school within a school? And the school within a school, that's where the parent would actually sign a contract with you as the school district, that they'll get their kid there on time, that they will support and make sure that the homework is done, that they will support you. You know, everybody loves discipline until it's your own kid. That's true for all of us. That's, you know, cuts across. So, but, but the truth is that if we can do that kind of, uh, we're, Catholic schools are based on contract law. The paying of tuition is that parental contract. That's why it, I think, is so powerful. But, but we can do that. I think the public schools could do that as well. And that creates, again, that expectation, that shared expectation for discipline, for safety. And you can't go with the minimum. You can't say, let's not bully. But can't we talk about reverence for the human person? We can freely. But I think public schools can too. Just built on natural law and common law as to say these are the things we need to do in a civil society to get along with each other. All right. So we'll turn the tables, John Claude. You, you're waking up now in Sister Mary Paul's office. What are, what are you going to do? Well, she, she answers the much higher power than I do. <laughs> <laughs> you might do that first. To yeah. get in touch. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's actually something I've, I've thought about, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about um, finding a way to have what I call backpack funding, uh, making sure that dollars follow children, not just within the system, but the charters, the parochial, et cetera. Um, and it doesn't make sense that parents pay taxes and then having to pay tuition to go to school as well. So one thing I would push um, is that you know, the archdiocese be a much larger part of our portfolio. So not just in sharing effective practices around discipline curriculum, uh, teacher training, principal training, et cetera, but really finding ways to, as we're doing right now with the charter world, uh, to make it a part of the system. For instance, even a single enrollment system, so a real choice. So parents can choose among a number of different, different, different options. I really would push for that. Leverage the charter laws um, or the contract process within CPS 
to then have people probably be part of what we do as a, um, as, as a school district. Because again, if, if we did this really, really well, then parents could, could, could just select based through a centralized enrollment system. Um, I know that Mike has some, some issues with talking, actually building it right now. Um, yes. But the, 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 one, the one push, go back to the charter law, um, I mean, and, and from what I've seen, again, I went to Catholic school, from what I've seen of many parents now in, in the system, it's not the religious education they actually strive for, but it's a good, solid, safe school they want their children in. So the, the religious education could be done before or after, but during the school day and leveraging the existing structure within the state to become a much, to have a much larger market share of our system would be great. It goes back to the system of school versus the school system. So if you really believe in that concept, um, it's a matter of making sure that you provide choice to parents no matter where they live and having the, 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 your portfolio be part of the city's portfolio of options for parents. So I would even push for that. So Jean-Claude, if I had risk of trying to break news in a room of 500, <laughs> um, I, what I think one of the things I, I, one could infer from that comment is that, that this idea of scholarships, public dollars being invested in scholarships in private parochial schools you might support? Well, not might, I would support. It's a matter of making sure the dollars follow children. Okay. Um, if, if we, uh, if 500 CPS, traditional CPS, uh, and for me, I see all the kids in the city as my, my kids, but 500 uh, CPS traditional were to go to the parochial schools, those dollars should follow. If it's special ed dollars for, for my DEA or Title I, whatever it is, the proportional share should go to the school that's actually educating those children. So you've all done a very good job avoiding this word vouchers, but this is quite a, 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 an unusual position for, for an urban school, public school leader to take, mm -hmm. um, to say, whatever it takes, let's make sure that children... That parents have a choice. And parents yes. have a choice, yeah. exactly. I, so, Mike, this is probably not a dream scenario for you. It's probably a, a, a nightmare scenario for you to wake up, but I'm going to have you wake up and be in Jean-Claude's office as well. Oh, it was no dream or nightmare. It was <laughs> actuality if you followed the media for the last three weeks. I did wake up in Jean-Claude's shoes about three weeks ago, and it was not fun. Um, spending about 80% of my time talking with um, media, public officials, um, uh, various groups, uh, I gained even more respect for the work that you do every day, and that is no joke. Uh, it really is uh, a, a difficult um, job to be because we're all here about educating children well, and there's lots of distractions, but far more that come, um, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis as the CEO of a public school district like Chicago. So hats off, but um, I, I found that, first of all, I would try to figure out how to get more hours in the day because there just aren't enough um, to do what, what I would want to do. And what I'd want to do, I'm, I'm really only at one thing, and uh, because most of what I would do is going on right now, and that's with the portfolio and the focus on human capital um, and so forth. The one maybe even nuance that I would have, but I think it's an important one, it, I think the biggest reason for Noble's success and other schools have been really successful is having the right adults, and mostly that's principals and teachers, but even other staff. And I think the district is looking at how do we make that happen. Um, I would say even more so, make it about attracting the right people more so than training the people they have. I think it's hard for a district to do a lot of professional development for teachers, even for principals. I think the most important thing is to try to make that job of principal, the most important, very attractive. And so the $25,000 uh, incentive um, for principals to come to the district schools I think is one good move. Other things would be to give them more power over budget and staffing. Um, you're going to attract better people that way. Of course, part of that's the collective bargaining agreement and working on, I mean, that's important for two reasons. One, if you make that collective bargaining agreement one that is more friendly to principals and teachers, I think then you're going to attract better principals. You're going to be able to reward teachers um, and attract the highest performing teachers who, who want to be rewarded for performance. And I know it's really messy when you do that from a district level, but I think it's how do we make the teacher job more attractive? Even more importantly, how do we make the principal job more attractive? And, and I think the biggest ways are making that job pay well, but more importantly, as we have at the Noble campuses, um, complete autonomy over budget, over staffing, not just 
who they hire, but how they staff it. And you know, we don't count the number of students and we get this many guidance counselors. The principals see what they need in their school, which is different in every campus of ours. And we're very similar campus to campus. Across the 600 and more and more, if you count parochial schools, across the city, you, there is no question that the more principal, po more power a principal has, the more they're gonna be able to impact the students positively and the better candidates you'll attract. Sure, absolutely, and I want to piggyback on what Mike's saying. It's exactly what we're going to as a district. So amongst the few levers, we're really pushing for as much as possible full devolution of power to principals um, in terms of time, people, and money, um, giving them control of the schools. We've got to also build the, uh, the accountability framework at the same time to hold them accountable. Um, so it's capacity building, it's recruitment, it's really changing um, the collection of, of, of leaders within our system unleashing their power. Anything, anyone who thinks they can control 670 plus schools from central office fooling themselves. And, and we have a system that tries to do that by remote control. Um, it doesn't work. Um, you've got to give that unit uh, absolute autonomy and hold them accountable and making sure that they have the capacity uh, to do their job and to build a constellation of great adults in the building. You watch what happens with the turnaround with AUSL, it's exactly that. You have a principal with a, a great set of teachers, the exact same kids you see wonderful things begin to happen. So it's about making sure that we follow the kind of model to push the lever as far toward autonomy as possible while holding people accountable. And we have just done a study of 92 of our 256 schools. It exactly says the same thing. If you have a great leader in place, everything can then fall into place. Absolutely. It strikes me that if, if, if you don't, um, we know what happens as well. Yes. And unless, um, when charter schools were created, there was this, this promise that for greater accountability, you would receive greater autonomy. Um, and yet, one of the things that seems not to happen regularly enough, whether in charter or in public, traditional public school context, is those hard decisions about school closures mm -hmm. um, or, or complete uh, turnarounds. Mm -hmm. So that's the tension in this theory of, of push it all down to the school level and to onto the, the, the shoulders of a, of a great school leader. Yeah, if they're great, I get it. But if they're, if they're not, or if they're somewhere in the middle and you think you can do better, which is a much larger percentage of the schools, um, then what? I mean, just. They need support and tools, and that's what we found out. You have a great person, but you also have to have great templates, some great models, great encouragement. Uh, leadership Academy, things you can do to support them because it is a tremendously lonely job. People think they can be a principal and everybody thinks they can do a better job than a principal, let's face it. But it, it isn't the case. I think there have to be some structures in place so you can have that very much organic or with respect for the local level. But the fact of the matter is a lot of the local levels do not have the capacity, have not had the practice, and it takes a lot to do a real good school turnaround. And I would just add that I think that it is still about making that job more attractive so you get the best people in. And that's the beauty of the portfolio model is that if schools, and, and, and I think with charters, and you do add parochial schools into that because ultimately 20 years ago there was no option for that. If parents weren't happy they had nowhere to go in the public system or they could potentially go to a, a, a parochial or private system um, but at some cost. Now parents can vote with their feet. And I think that that's an absolute crucial part of answering Tim's question of, well, what if these principals aren't performing? Mm -hmm. Well, in our network, we, can, we haven't made hardly any changes, but we haven't had to, but we can and we can quickly do it. And I think that freedom that we have, as well as if we don't satisfy our parents, we close down automatically. A little tougher for you to close down automatically, but we could close down a school tomorrow, and we wouldn't, lightly, but at the same time, we know that that principal is aware of that and they're doing everything they can and if I have to make a change, um, I can do it quite quickly and I think that that's important uh, alongside of the competition that comes from lots of other kinds of schools. All right, let's turn to you. Um, I think there are people with green, there's one, um, paddles and so if you have a question, they have microphones. Identify yourself very quickly and keep your question crisp. 
<laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Marvin Talley. I'm principal of a Technical Charter High School. And my question for you, Ron Heifetz and Dean Williams talk about technical versus adaptive challenges. And so they warn you about um, putting a technical fix for truly an adaptive challenge. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that as, as uh, we talk about that this afternoon? Who was it? Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you say more? Yeah. Well, the, the, technical the technical challenges are the easy ones. They're the low-hanging low fruit. Mm -hmm. And so the, the adaptive challenges, those are the ones that challenge us to uh, come up with new theories or to be bold, uh, to make uh, new decisions in terms of the challenges that we face. And so what, what are you, I just wanted to know what are your thoughts on that? I think I'll start. I think one of the difficulties around um, schools is that um, there's not a lot of tolerance for, for, for too much innovation. Um, because you're dealing with children, you're dealing with, with uh, the most prized possessions that, that people have. Um, and, and so they, they, they tend to want you to do incremental changes within schools, which is why closures and massive turnarounds tend to be quite, quite controversial. Um, but in terms of what I think will ultimately move systems, it, it, it will take a mini revolution to actually get there. Uh, when you look at the gap that we're trying to close between, say again, the highest performing countries and the lowest performing schools within our cities across this country, it will take that kind of uh, innovative push. And, and thankfully, we're beginning to see some of it around use of technology, uh, getting individual around intervention, um, like the new classroom school of one kind of concept. So we're beginning to see that through the use of technology, people are beginning to basically form uh, instructional programs around students versus schools or classrooms. Um, but schools change very, very slowly, uh, very slow to adapt to new technologies. And more often, you'll find that when those things are created, they're done for businesses, not for education. Um, but I think you begin to see some, some, some push. I think you'll, you'll find much greater innovation where there is the autonomy of, of charters or perhaps a principal within a, a, a traditional school district who perhaps believes it's easier to get forgiveness and permission and will push the lever far um, and, and balk the system. Uh, you renegades, um, so to say. So if you have those principals who understand uh, how to, to, to be different than the rest, you'll get the innovation. But schools traditionally are very slow, slow, slow to move into change. Yeah. My name's Kylan Caldero, and I wanted to address my question to several of the panelists. Uh, Sister Mary, while I agree that reading to children is important, but it's not enough if your child has a visual processing disorder, an auditory processing disorder, or problems with attention deficit. My son actually had all three, and it took me five years to put all of this together and I am an educator, so it's not enough. I would suggest that all schools focus on the assessment of visual, auditory, and attention processing disorders versus blaming children and parents and teachers and principals. Uh, an excellent example of work being done in this area is the Illinois College of Optometry and the president, Dr. Osberg, is here today. They're heading up a program with Chicago Public Schools to identify vision processing disorders for children. And I'd like to see that program expanded. Thank you very much. Um, question. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Lyon with Project Exploration. Um, we've been talking a lot about schooling, even though the title is The Future of Urban Education. And kids spend about 9% of their waking hours in school, and the rest of the time they're out of school. I'm curious, you spend all this time working so hard on problems about what's important for a great education for kids. Could you speak a little to things you're seeing out of school that are important for kids, what you think people should be investing in, especially in support of the agendas you've laid out today? Thank you. Well, one thing is many of our schools, the kids are there from six to six. So that is, we're, although that's true for many of the, the schools of choice that the, the time's going to be less, I think we do have to recognize there is, a, there is a lot of time the kids do spend in school or in school related activities. For me, it's making sure that there's a rich environment, something that the kid does not have to try out for. That was always my rule as a high school administrator. Involve yourself in something. And something beyond, uh, if we could turn some of the 
a love of the computer into some blended learning, the, the integrated technology, that's all good. The kids need to still get out, they still need to be healthy, they have to have leadership opportunities. So to that point, in many, in many areas, the parents are able to provide that for them. For schools, we too have to take a look and say, what are those co-curriculars that kids can get engaged in, not just athletics or not just something that's competitive, even though I love speech team, what can you what can you join? What, what can you be a part of? Because we are a piece of that community, and leadership skills are so important. So every school has to identify that, and outside of school, to have parents do that kind of support. Um, there are tons of parent program, tons of parent resources, but it's getting parents to use them. And th and sometimes we are parenting the parents. And I, I would just add from a policy perspective. Having the money follow the child, whether that's um, IDA money that follows the child or money that follows ch children to charter schools and, and this portfolio um, system is a way of addressing that exact question that Gabrielle raised because some schools now um, have very different hours. Uh, some charters, even some districts, it, it used to be much more monolithic, but now we see that some Students learn differently. Maybe it's better if they're done at 12 and they're going off to a college program. Um, maybe there's summers that are used different. The calendar is much um, different now it, because it, it, so many different schools have been trying different things to see what works best for the families, what works best for the student. The hours have, have really changed in the way that schooling can and, and should be done. Um, and so I think that the more choices that are out there and true choices that parents can um, demand and the best ones or the ones that serve the needs the best will be the ones that grow. Uh, I think you're going to be able to address learning that's inside the classroom, outside the classroom, and part of outside the classroom is perhaps having hours that coincide better with other learning opportunities. So my, my last layer to that is that I think you're beginning to see um, uh, some of the uh, push for change right now based on data what's coming out because of achievement. Uh, for me, I, I looked at the educational infrastructure the same way you looked at the oil industry and, and the, the maybe uh, uh, green cars. You know, it, it took a lot for us to get to where we are right now because it's a monopoly on, on, on what's happening uh, right now with textbooks and, and textbook publishers. So hopefully I don't have friends here from, from McGraw Hill and, and, and the other places. <laughs> but, former but, friends. Yeah, former friends. <laughs> but the, the whole concept of everywhere learning, I think, is going to begin to push that. Young children today, young people are already pushing on the envelope. So uh, my two-year-old son is very proficient on the iPad. I mean, very, very proficient from 13 months to now. Um, so when you look at what he'll demand when he gets into school, he is not going to have the patience to sit there for six hours and be talked at for six hours. So that school will need to change to adapt to perhaps what, how he's learning. And you're watching that happening right now in our school systems, kids walking away because they're completely bored. So it goes back to perhaps uh, entrepreneurs and, and small outfits. I, I'm not hopeful you're going to see the massive innovation come from the big sort of publishing houses. It's going to come from places like wireless generation, from small groups who are looking to completely rip apart what we do. It's going to come from uh, new charter operators. It's going to come from, from rocket ship and other places who are leveraging technology in very, very different ways, time in very different ways, blowing up the master schedule in very different ways. So you're going to begin to see it. The problem we have, though, is that much of this tends to happen outside of the mainstream. And the big question is how do we push that into the school system? And that will take policy changes. It will take, um, I was talking to my colleagues earlier today, um, on Friday we met in Washington, D.C., the big three cities, with Ani Duncan. And we said to, to Ani's staff and Ani, the three districts, the three largest urbans, are bigger than 44 states in America. So don't push race to the top to the states, push it to us. Um, give us the leverage, give us the freedom, don't handcuff us. Don't give me 14,000 compliance things I have to do with that money, but really unleash the potential, hold us accountable, you begin to see real innovation begin to happen in a way that will sort of filter into the largest districts in America. Hello, Dan Valliere with Chicago Commons. Um, great to hear all the talk about parent involvement. Um, I think that's key. And I'm curious about parent governance at the school level and whether that's also a tool or a, a part of the process for a reform, such as a local school council with CPS or other parent committees. I, I, I'll, I'll stop. I, I'm going to go radical yeah. perhaps quickly first, right? 
Um, so one of the biggest experiments right now is to watch what's happening in California with the parent trigger uh, to see really what that will bring in terms of forceful change into uh, a monolithic uh, sort of body one of the craziest school districts in America, LA, LA Unified. Um, to see what that will do for the system, where parents actually force the school to actually change. You saw a little bit of it here in one of the turnarounds. Um, I forgot which one, but actually came from the LSCs and the parents who came and said, we want to change in that school. I mean, the data clearly supported what they wanted to see happen. Um, the fear, I think, for, for some is that if you don't have um, um, a group of parents who can perhaps stay outside of politics or the, the political piece, they can be easily influenced by special interest. Um, so the, 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 that's the fear I think some have in the city about the parent trigger and ways of pushing that. But we do believe in parent engagement. We do believe in parent, parent empowerment. The LSC, I think, is a, is, is a good vehicle if we make sure we nurture and, and work with them. As you can imagine, in, in the high-performing schools, you've got great LSCs. In some of our low-performing schools, I've, they can't even get a quorum together to get folks to meet on a regular basis. So building that infrastructure to make them a powerful tool in forcing change in the system uh, is one we have to leverage, one we have to do, and like I said earlier, probably the most difficult job we have to do as a school system. And parent group parents' engagement are very important, but we also have, they shouldn't not necessarily be doing that at the policy level. So for example, we have a second level of boards, which are called boards of specified jurisdiction, but in those particular boards, only a fourth of the, of the folks on it can be parents. Exactly for that reason, uh, for not to avoid the special interests, to re-engage alumni, to have businesses, to bring in technology, to have a perspective from a broader community of what's going to be needed um, for, those for those children in the future. And, and I want to add why I think choice is far more powerful to parents than a, a parent governing board, whether it be at a, a charter um, district or, or parochial school. Because, I mean, all of you can think yourselves, w would you gain a lot of power by electing representatives at a restaurant that's close to your house as a restaurant consumer and you could only go to that restaurant? Because that's how it was for many, many years in Chicago, especially if you're talking about public option. But you can, you know, elect people who are gonna hire the manager and prepare the menu. It may have nothing to do with what serves you well or your family well, but that's what a lot of people see as parental power. What I see as parental power is lots of choices that if they are served well, they can stay and their child can be in that school. But if they're not serving the child well, they have another choice that they can go to. That's what makes restaurants perform really well, is when they know there's competition, I better serve them well. But if it's the only game in town, well, it, it's not, and it doesn't matter who controls the manager or whatever, it's not very effective for getting great performance. And I think the more choices are out there, um, that's how parents really have power and how they are really the ones who hold all the accountability cards in the end. And one more just, just one, last, one last point, yeah. just very quickly. The one that we also have to do is help parents understand how to access the choice system. Because too often we'll find that the school on the corner is a school of choice for so many people. Uh, we, we say they're trapped by geography uh, and don't often know how to access. And very quickly, Michael Gladwell talks about this. Um, watching young high school students who had full access to scholarships at universities, only about 20% taking advantage of it because no one taught them how to access equity. So we've got to make sure that we also help the parents understand what's available so they can force their way into the system. One more question from here and then I have one more question for you, Cushman. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Sam Banks and I'm uh, connected with uh, Glenwood School for Boys and Girls and my question uh, piggybacks on the comments being made regarding choice and options and vari having variety for, to meet the variety of needs for students. Uh, the school that I represent is a boarding school for low, for, uh, low income and at-risk at students. And I'm interested in the panels thinking about uh, that uh, model being an option, one of those variety of options for CPS, CPS students and if you think that that is something worth exploring. Yes. Um, this is a short, short question. Uh, Having actually, had some of your kids, <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I was talking to um, an individual in Washington, in California, who was opening a school um, for foster care kids. Uh, that includes housing, um, combining social services, schooling services, housing services, all in one place with the goal of propelling these kids to some of the best colleges in the country. So the, the short answer is yes, we'd love to talk. So one of my takeaways is that everybody in this group um, supports a much, much more robust, diverse portfolio of school options and offerings in Chicago, whether they be private 
parochial or public. Um, and that's, I think, an exciting thing for the, the people in this room who are friends of or of um, the Economics Club of Chicago. Um, I have a question for you for on behalf of the people in this room that I wanted to wrap up with, and that is really what can people here do to support you um, and, your, and this work, and at least that being one of the visions of this work. Um, there's information that it was on your chairs. You can look at that. You're welcome to reach out to any of us if you want to dig in more deeply. Um, that's one thing, is to, to get school, as it were. But, but what can people here do um, as they, uh, or think about doing as they walk out of here this afternoon? I'll, I'll go last. I went first. Okay. <laughs> You want to go? <laughs> yeah. um, I think what I would, I would ask you to do is, it goes back to that backpack model. Support, if you would, please. Uh, understanding the, the money following the child. It isn't about the money, it's about the children. It's finding those resources. You know, whether it's Big Shoulders Fund, whether it is a, a parish, whether it is um, independent donors, whether down the line there's some kind of a capital campaign that provides a scholarship, whether or not it's, and I believe it should be, to, to your point, ma'am, I would love to do that, but my speech services started for my children who deserved it, IDEA, two weeks ago. In the public schools, they started in August. So there is a scandal here, there is a sin here that I think really needs to be addressed. So it's a clarity about this being about kids. That's the translation that I would really like today. Oh, I'm good. So um, I can say this, uh, I uh, do have two children in a Catholic school, so supporting those individually, I've been asked, I do every day. Um, I know that um, Sister Mary Paul would be happy to for asking for your support for any of those uh, schools that are doing great work. We also, we have facility um, issues, that's what many charters do, where we don't get enough money for facility, and so we raise money. That's super important to us, and of course the information's there, we appreciate being on this forum to be able to get that voice out. But I think there's also a, a very important political task for everybody out here, um, and that's around the support um, for some of these, uh, some of this work that's going on. And so, uh, specifically, I mean, there's groups like the Illinois Network of Charter Schools and New Schools for Chicago who are supporting all the things that we're talking about here um, to try to get more options for parents and to try to get less bureaucracy for the district. Um, and those are really important too. And then just a as you are in, uh, working with people, public officials, uh, whether it's aldermen, state legislators, Congress people, all um, of them have huge influence on what goes on and to the point where you can say yes, it does make sense, whether it's money following the child or the ability to create more options and have less bureaucracy, um, the stu students will be served better. John Paul, Do, last word. Um, I think both actually covered much of what I wanted to say. Um, it goes back to, to I guess, a uh, line that I use, is that please be cool with that passengers in this work. Um, we need people to, to voice their opinions. We don't want folks to stay quiet. The power of the pen, a letter to the editor, I think is a wonderful way of pushing this. The, the biggest soft spot in our reform effort, I think, lies in the state capitol. Uh, when I was in New York, it was the exact same issue in Albany. Uh, you have individuals who are trying to legislate their way in controlling reform efforts um, in, our, in our city. Um, and, and you'd be amazed how soft that spot is. You've got amazing people who are pushing the other direction as well, uh, from our city and from outside. Uh, please talk to these electeds, uh, making sure that we continue to have the momentum to do what needs to be done. Um, SB7 was an amazing uh, piece of legislation for us last year. Uh, we don't want it undermined, um, and, and there are many who are a actively trying to undermine that, that, that amazing piece of, of, of legislation. Um, the other piece uh, I, I would push as well um, um, is to make sure that the, the, the groups who are working on behalf of reforms um, in, in Chicago to be supported. Um, you know, the you know, uh, um, Associated Charter Schools, Stanford Children, lots of them um, are, are actively in Springfield making sure that the work is not undermined. So anything you can do to support that I think would be terrific. Um, as well as, I mean, the groups like the Public Education Fund here in Chicago as well, all of those are ways in which we can get our work done. So please don't be a passenger, be a crew member. Uh, well, we've reached the bewitching hour. Please join me in thanking our panel. Uh, and it's, 
I think it's clear to me that, that you all should stay in your offices and, and ignore my dream scenario. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for coming. Yes, on behalf of the Economic Club, our Chairman John Canning, President Donna Zarconi, and especially to you, Timothy, Jean-Claude, Michael, and Sister Mary Paul for a very enlightening lunch and discussion. We thank you all and wish you a good day. Thank you.